Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we're discussing 5-HT3 receptors. Okay, now I just realised that uh, I didn't really finish my discussion of these, so I need to tell you about their actual function. I've told you about their structure. Now their function, their function is that they are going to bind 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine. Uh, so let me talk about this down here. So 5-HT3 receptors are basically receptors for 5-HT, and 5-HT stands for 5-hydroxytryptamine, okay, tryptamine, okay, and 5-hydroxytryptamine has another name, it's also called serotonin, and serotonin is kind of like its stage name. It's the one that the tabloids know about, it's the one that people know is to do with mood and depression and things like that. Uh, people know that it's the one that's targeted by the infamous drug Prozac, proper name for the oxetine. Okay, right, so this molecule is going to act on these 5-HT3 receptors. But what is this molecule? So let's discuss the structure of this molecule. So basically, in order to discuss this, we need to know what tryptamine is. Okay? And tryptamine is basically modified version of the amino acid tryptophan. So firstly, let's discuss the structure of the amino acid tryptophan which, by the way, has the single letter amino acid code, W. Okay, right, so the structure of the amino acid tryptophan, then. So here's the amino group of the amino acid tryptophan. Here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it. Here's the carboxylic acid group coming off the alpha carbon. And then the R group of tryptophan is that you have a methylene group here, and then you have something known as an indole ring. So I now need to tell you what an indole ring is. But to tell you what an indole ring is, I need to tell you what a pyrrole ring is. So we'll discuss what a pyrrole ring is, and then we'll discuss what an indole ring is. So a pyrrole ring is a five-membered ring. So let's draw this out. So you have five members, four of which are carbon, and then the fifth is nitrogen here. Okay, now let's put some double bonds in. So in the pyrrole ring, you have two double bonds, and it's nicely symmetric, like so. And then, finally, just add hydrogens onto everything that needs one more bond. So you put hydrogen here, hydrogen here, and hydrogen here. So it's an absolutely beautifully symmetric uh, molecule, basically. So this is the pyrrole ring. Now, the indole ring is a slightly modified version of the pyrrole ring. So now let's show the indole ring. Okay, so the structure of the indole ring is basically you take your pyrrole ring and you stick a benzene ring onto it. So let's put this in. So you've got this five-membered pyrrole ring here with a nitrogen up here. And then off this, you're now going to attach a six-membered benzene ring. And remember back to your chemistry that um, benzene has alternating single and double bonds. So I'll just put in the double bonds associated with the pyrrole ring. And now to create this into benzene, you're going to have to alternate the double and single bonds, which means putting in double bonds here and here. Okay, and now just stick a hydrogen onto everything that needs a hydrogen. Okay, so hydrogen here, hydrogen off this nitrogen, hydrogen off this carbon here, hydrogen off this carbon, hydrogen here and another hydrogen off here. So this now is the structure of the indole ring. Okay, and now what you do is you literally take this indole ring and you bring it over here and you take that hydrogen off there, that one there, and you stitch this carbon to this carbon here. And that's the structure of tryptophan. So let's complete this now. So here is our pyrrole ring here, this five-membered ring. Uh, where four of the members are carbons, and then this fifth member up here is a nitrogen. And then we've got the benzene ring sticking off the side here, like so. Okay, with alternating double and single bonds. And let's put hydrogens on here, 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 and here. So that now is the amino acid tryptophan. Okay, so tryptamine. How do you get tryptamine? Well, what you're going to do to get tryptamine is you're going to chop off 
this carboxylic acid group here from the tryptophan and replace it by a hydrogen, okay? So you're going to say bye-bye to this, this carboxylic acid group here. It's gone, and it's going to be replaced by a hydrogen, okay, on that carbon. So this alpha carbon will now have two hydrogens coming off it here. So I might just draw that new hydrogen in. So this is gone, this hydrogen's replaced it. And that structure now is tryptamine. Okay, right. So how do you then modify it to 5-hydroxy tryptamine? Well, for that, you need to know how the elements of this, um, of this structure are numbered, basically. So we'll start with this carbon here. This carbon here is known as the alpha carbon, okay, because it was the alpha carbon of the amino acid. And the carbon off the alpha carbon is known as the beta carbon. So, those two have a completely separate uh, labelling system. Now we're going to label these um, elements in the indole ring. And there's only one special element in this entire indole ring. Everything else is carbon or hydrogen. So, basically we start with the nitrogen here. So the nitrogen is given the number 1, okay? Then we go around in this direction. So this next one is 2. This carbon here is 3. This carbon here is not 4. It's 3A for some bizarre reason. Uh, maybe someone better in organic chemistry can explain to me why that is called 3A, but uh, I'd be delighted to hear it in the comment section, but it is called 3A. Then this one here is called 4. This one here, 5. 6 here. 7 here, and again, this one isn't 8, it's 7a instead. Right, so these ones that are in both rings, for some reason, they're named in a different way. Okay, so, basically, we're now in the business. We have got 5-hydroxytryptamine, and we know where the fifth carbon is. So all we need to do is take that hydroxyl group off from there. Sorry, take that hydrogen off from there, and attach instead a hydroxyl group. So here's an alcohol group. We're going to attach that on and we'll get 5-hydroxytryptamine. Okay, so that's 5-HT or serotonin. Right, so when you release serotonin on the 5-HT3 receptor, and by the way, there are a huge number of other 5-HT receptors out there. The 5-HT3 receptors are the only ligand-gated ion channel um, five, uh, receptors that you have for serotonin. All the other receptors that you have for serotonin are of the G protein coupled receptor type. Okay, so the 5-HT1, 2, uh, and etc. onwards, uh, they are all G protein coupled receptors. The exception is the 5-HT3 receptors, which are, um, are um, ligand gated ion channels, specifically cis loop ligand gated ion channels. Right. Okay, so 5-HT3 is going to come and bind to the extracellular domain of the 5-HT3 receptor, and uh, that then is going to cause the channel to open. Now, I again wish that I could tell you exactly where the 5-HT3 uh, binds, but again, these things are just not known about the 5-HT3 receptor yet. We will find them, I'm sure, uh, but as of yet, they are not known. The nicotinic acetylcholine receptor has been very heavily studied, and uh, the other cis loop ligand gated ion channels were only just beginning to understand them. So, for instance, I think the GABA A receptor was only crystallized in this year, so um, it's it's ongoing area of research. Okay, so what we do know is that when serotonin binds to the extracellular domain of these 5-HT3 receptors, whether they are 5-HT3A homopentamers or 5-HT3AB heteropentamers, it's going to cause them to open. Now, when they open, uh, they are going to allow the conductance of cations. Okay, so let's turn over the page to discuss this. So, basically, if we have the membrane here, and we have our 5-HT uh, free receptor, either the homopentamer or the heteropentamer, okay? Then what it's going to do is when it opens, it's now going to allow cations to move through it. So the cations that are important in uh, physiology 
are sodium, potassium, and calcium. Now, the 5-HT3 receptor is quite highly permeable to sodium and potassium. However, its permeability to calcium is very low, so this one is very low. Now, so what's going to happen when we open this 5-HT3 receptor? Okay, well, let me give you the concentration gradients that we have for sodium, potassium, and calcium across the cell. So, we basically have an extracellular sodium concentration of around 145 millimolar. We have an intracellular sodium concentration of around 12 millimolar. For potassium, it's reversed. We have an intracellular concentration of 155 millimolar and an extracellular concentration of 4 millimolar. And calcium, even though I've said it doesn't really matter because the conductance is incredibly low, at calcium, you have an extracellular concentration of 1.5 millimolar and intracellular concentration of 100 nanomolar. And respect the calcium concentration gradient because compared to these, it's uh, it is phenomenally large. This is a 15,000-fold concentration gradient that is maintained across the cell membrane. These are titchy in comparison. This is around a 40-fold gradient, and this is a 12-fold gradient. So even though 1.5 millimolar looks titchy compared to 145 millimolar of sodium, the concentration gradient is much more uh, powerful in calcium's case. However, the receptor is not very permeable to calcium, so we'll look at sodium and potassium. Now, basically, the concentration gradient of sodium is favouring the movement of sodium in, and the concentration gradient of potassium is favouring the movement of potassium out. So you'd think that you were going to get movement of sodium in and movement of potassium out. However, there's one piece of information that I've neglected on this diagram, and that is the usual electrical potential difference that you have across the membrane. Okay, the voltage from extracellular to intracellular. Okay, so this means the electrical potential difference from extracellular to intracellular. So it means if a little man was to stand in the extracellular compartment and measure the electrical potential, big E, of the extracellular compartment, okay, he gets some number. Then if he was to come into the intracellular compartment and measure the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment, he'd get another number. Okay, these two numbers are going to be different. They're not the same. Okay, now what we can ask is how much different is this one compared to this one? So we can ask, what is the new electrical potential, i.e. when he's moved from the outside to the inside, what's the new electrical potential, and subtract off the old electrical potential, i.e., how much will your electrical potential readout change if you move from extracellular to intracellular? That's what's meant by the voltage across the membrane. Now, most people often just drop this extracellular to intracellular just out of sloppiness. In reality, this is directed. You need to tell me the direction you are moving across the membrane. Otherwise, uh, I only know the answer up to, the, up to a sign. Okay? Um, when people say the electrical potential difference across the cell, this is what they mean. They mean from extracellular to intracellular, uh, but often they neglect to actually say that. They just say voltage or membrane potential. Okay, now it's usually something around negative 65 millivolts, which means that the intracellular electrical potential is lower than the extracellular electrical potential by around 65 millivolts. Okay, now both sodium and potassium are uh, cations. They are positively charged. They both prefer to be in places where the electrical potential is lower, which is the intracellular compartment. So the sodium ions are going to feel a force pulling them into the intracellular compartment, and so are the potassium ions. Now, in the case of the sodium ions, this is going to aid the concentration gradient to increase the movement of sodium in. In the case of potassium ions, it's going to oppose it. So the overall movement of potassium ions is going to get much smaller. So basically, you might wonder, well, why doesn't it stop the movement altogether? 
Basically, it's not strong enough to beat the concentration gradient driving force, okay? Uh, you'd need to take the re electrical potential difference to around negative 85 in order to, for the um, electrical gradient across this membrane to completely oppose the concentration gradient of potassium. So this isn't strong enough to stop all movement of potassium, but it does reduce it considerably. So basically, when you open this receptor, what's going to happen is you're going to get a big movement of sodium in, a tiny movement of potassium out. So, overall, the movement of positive charge is going to be inwards. So you're going to have a positive charge uh, flow inwards, a current, basically, coming inwards. And this is what's known as an excitatory, excitatory postsynaptic current. Okay, so the name for this current, this, a current is just uh, a flow of charge. Uh, the name for this current, this positive current into the cell, is an excitatory postsynaptic current. Okay, often abbreviated to EPSC. Okay, for short. Now, when you move the positive charge into the cell, that's going to raise the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment. It's also going to lower the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment because you're moving the positive charge out of the extracellular compartment. So you're removing positive charge from the extracellular compartment and that will reduce the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment. Now, initially, the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment was lower by 65 millivolts than the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment. But now I'm raising the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment and reducing the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment. So that means that the amount by which the intracellular electrical potential is lower than the extracellular electrical potential will get smaller, i.e. this number will get uh, less negative, which is known as depolarization. So, this excitatory postsynaptic current is going to cause depolarization of uh, the uh, voltage across the cell membrane. And this depolarization of the voltage is also known as an excitatory postsynaptic potential. Excitatory postsynaptic potential, or an EPSP for short. So, the excitatory postsynaptic current causes an excitatory postsynaptic potential in the uh, postsynaptic cell. Okay, and that's going to make the postsynaptic cell more likely to fire. So that's the role of these 5-HT3 receptors. They are uh, functioning as a ligand-gated ion channel in, SS in essence. Okay, in the next video what we'll do is talk about this experiment where we show how similar the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is to the, um, well, specifically the alpha-7 subunit of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, how similar that is to the 5-HT3A uh, receptor subunit.